1 Corinthians chapter 9. If you brought your Bible, you can open it up to chapter 9, verse 19. If you have a Bible app on your phone, same thing, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19. I think there's a, a danger in a series like this to feel like it's kind of really just about teaching us the everyday th things that we need to know, wisdom, how to better live this life. And what's really clear is that if we're going to be establishing boundaries in our life, we need to have deeper reasons than just then it's gonna make my life a little better today. Not that that's bad. We all want to experience joy in our life. I know I do, I'm sure you do. But what we're gonna to learn today is that what allowed the Apostle Paul and others in the Bible, but today specifically the Apostle Paul, not only to establish and deploy boundaries, but to overcome and defeat the resistance that he faced when he established boundaries, he had to have some pretty deep reasons to do that. And I wanna share those with you today because those are the same deep reasons for establishing boundaries that you're gonna to need to overcome the people who might not like the boundaries that you're setting. And by the way, let's be really clear, whenever we establish boundaries, where do you think the greatest resistance is going to come from? Anyone ever tried to diet? You set some boundaries up, where did the greatest resistance come from? Anyone ever tried to change your schedule and, and make it in a way that you think's better? Where did the greatest resistance come from? Well, for me, it came from me. And so part of what we're talking about is the reality that every time we try to establish new boundaries, yes, we, we can expect a, a little battles from other people, but the, the, the real truth is we're going to expect the biggest battle from our own hearts because we're sinful, and as sinful people, we're resistant even to our own boundaries that we want to establish for our own good. If you get my email... Uh, and it's actually our email because Pastor Dan writes it on the weeks that he's up to preach. If you get our email, then this week I, I said there's research out there that says that even if you're told it's a life or death matter, but there are changes that you can make that today will make a huge difference in your life and help you live a better, longer life Making those changes and setting up those boundaries, only one out of nine people are going to do it. Isn't that incredible? That's the resistance that we have. So we have to have powerful reasons why. Now let me start by talking about why I think this is an eternal matter, a spiritual matter, much more than just a practical everyday matter. God in the Bible really establishes some big boundaries, and one of them is the boundary that he establishes around time to worship him and to receive strength from him. And we know that as the commandment, uh, you shall honor the Sabbath day. Now I wanna give you a definition. You don't have a blank, so grab your pen. I still want, I want you to write this definition. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. What God is actually saying there is, remember the Sabbath day, keep time. By keeping it holy means setting it apart, establishing boundaries around it. Now here's what it means. Creating space for eternal matters of the soul. Remembering the Sabbath day by keeping it holy is you and me creating space for eternal matters of the soul. That's one of the first chief boundaries God asks us to establish in our lives, that we are to create space in our lives for eternal matters of the soul. Do you have space in your life for eternal matters of the soul? Do you, do you, do you have plenty of wiggle room for eternal matters of the soul? Or do you sometimes feel like life and even the people that you love and the world are sort of crushing in on you, squeezing you, and, and driving that space for eternal matters of the soul smaller and smaller every day. 
You see, when, when Paul talks about the boundaries in his life that he established, every one of them, the big ones, had to do with, I'm doing this because I want to create space in my life for eternal matters of the soul. And I'm doing this not because I'm forced to do it. I'm doing this because this is what deep down in all my Christian freedom as a dearly loved child of God with my sins fully forgiven, this is what I wanna do. And that's why I love how Paul starts here. Look at what he says, and I put this in your crosswalk notes. Though I am free, and belong to no one. Paul starts by establishing his position as a free agent. Now, we we know that word free agent from the sports world, but I wanted to get a broader definition of free agent. What does that mean? And this is what I came up with from from the dictionary. A free agent is a person who does not have any commitments that restrict their actions. How do you feel about that? Would you, along with the Apostle Paul, be able to say, I am free and belong to no one, which means I have no commitments that restrict my actions. That's what Paul's saying here. Paul is saying, and you can write this down, through Christ, I am free of the demands and the expectations of everyone. No one can guilt me. I'm I'm not going to be afraid to say no. I'm a free agent. And whatever demands or expectations other people want to put on me, or even the ones that I want to put on myself, I'm free. I am a free agent. Now, that's an amazing statement. I don't know if you struggle with that, but I do. To be able to say I don't have to meet anyone else's expectations of me. Now, as a pastor, I I not only love to meet the expectations others have of me, I want to exceed their expectations. I want to go above and beyond. And so, to adopt the attitude that's kind of beautiful here, to say, I'm not a slave to anybody. I truly am free to do as I want to do and as God wants me to do. That's amazing, because that's what Paul means here. Through Christ, I'm free of the demands and expectations of everyone. Then Paul goes on, and an amazing twist happens here. A very surprising turn to the end of the statement. Notice that where I left the quote off, though I am free and belong to no one, there's three important things that come after that. Dot, 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 which means this continues. Now let's look and see how Paul continues it. I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Though I'm free and belong to no one, Paul says, on the other hand, I've made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Now, you're going to notice in this next segment, I've pulled out three verses from the overall section that we're studying today because all these next three verses deliver on why is Paul doing this? Why, if he is free, does he then turn around and say, but I make myself a servant to everyone? And he explains it. Number one, I I want to win as many people to Christ as I can. This This relationship that I have with Jesus Christ has not only been mind and heart altering, it has been completely life altering for me. I can't even imagine going back to my old way of life where I thought it was all up to me and that if I didn't perform well, God wouldn't love me and that if I wanted to to reach eternal life, I had to work for it, that it was not a gift, but it was all my effort that got me there. That was my former way. Now I understand the grace of God, and I am not going back. I'm a dearly loved child of God. And so, number one, I want to win other people. I want as many people as possible to know about Jesus Christ. That's number one. Then he he goes on a few verses later, and he says, I do all this for the sake of the gospel. Circle that word, gospel. That I may share in its blessings. So 
Paul is really saying this. Here, here's what the gospel is. The gospel is a very simple, straightforward message that God, in his great love for us, saw us lost, condemned in our sin, headed for hell, and sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to be our savior, to forgive all of our sins. Christ died on the cross as the perfect sacrifice and then was raised again three days later to obtain forgiveness, new life, and eternal salvation for you and for all people. That's the gospel. And now Paul says, God loved me that much. So now for the, for the sake of that great love that the gospel conveys to me, tells me about, I want to live my life as a life of gratitude. I want to love God in return, in response to the great love that he's shown me by sending his son Jesus for me. I do this all for the sake of the gospel. I make myself a servant to others because I love that gospel promise that God makes me. And then he goes on in the last verse, no, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. It's amazing. This is how Paul ends this section. And do you see what he's saying there? He's saying, I, I'm out there to save the souls of others. My life is centered on God's love portrayed in the gospel for me. But there's one other thing I don't lose track of, and that's that I have a soul too. And that I have a promise of eternal life, and I never want to lose that. I don't want to be sharing this prize with others and be disqualified myself. So I make it my business to serve God and serve others. What, what Paul is really saying is, I have some God-given purposes in my life. And, and this is something that was not just for the Apostle Paul. This, these are purposes that God gives every child of his, every Christ follower. If you read through the scriptures, you know that once you've received faith in Jesus Christ, God says, go out and, and share. That's why we baptize, because Jesus himself said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Jesus tells that to every disciple of his. Find the lost, share the message, win as many as possible. That is your purpose for being here. What about the next one? Have your life revolve around saying one big thank you to God for the gospel? If you're a Christ follower, that's, that's what your life revolves around. God has given you so much. You are so spiritually wealthy because of the gospel. And so your life becomes one of saying, thank you, God, for this. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for raising your son for the, from the grave. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for calling and inviting me to faith in Jesus. Thank you. I love you because I know that you love me. That applies. And taking care of your soul, like Paul says here, so that you're not disqualified for the prize, that's absolutely part of your life as a Christian. Paul likes to use the, the metaphor, the picture of a race. And he, he talks about running the race so as to win the prize. And one of the big things that I, I think we have to understand, if, if we're going to overcome resistance and defeat resistance to boundaries, is we have to get connected, like Paul was, to these eternal, overarching, big purposes that God has given us. And, and we see that Paul overcomes resistance to boundaries simply because he's, he's so tapped into why God has left him here. And maybe the first secret that I can share with you from the Apostle Paul from this text is, if you want to be a person who will meet resistance to the boundaries that you set up, make sure that your boundaries are being set up in a God-pleasing way to serve these purposes so that you can win the souls of others. So, so that 
you can have this ability to say, God, I love you and I'm so thankful to you for all that you've done so that you can ultimately take care of your own soul. You've been given only one soul. God wants you to take care of it. And so when you create boundaries, it's all about that. That's why God set up the boundary with Sabbath day. Have a time, have a space where you devote energy to the care of your own soul. I call that the race. I don't know if you've ever run a race, but if you run a race, typically if you're a 100 meter or a 200 meter runner, those are your races. And those are the races that you run and you, you usually don't switch and, and go from being a 100 or 200 meter runner to being a marathon runner. It's a, it's a completely different style. You have a race and you tend to stick with that race. It's sort of a permanent thing. And, and that's what Paul is saying. I run this race. I try to win others. I, I try to say, God, I love you and I thank you every day. I try to take care of my soul because this is the race that God has laid out for me. But you also know that when you run races, it's not just what race you're running, it's also what lane you're running in. And it's very under, uh, important that we all understand the difference between our race and our lane. Let me lay that out for you. So your race is winning others, tending to your own faith, loving and thanking God. That's all of our race. But we do have different lanes that we run that race in. Some of us run that, as Paul did, in the apostle lane. Some of us run it in the pastor lane. Some of us run it in the, the, the tradesman lane or the professional lane or the entrepreneur lane. Some of us run it in the dad lane or the mom lane or the grandma or the grandpa lane. Now, why do I compare those things to lanes? Because every time you run a race, you could be given a different lane. It's a temporary thing. I'm a grandpa. I was just given that lane not so very long ago. Before that, I was running in the dad lane. I'm running also in the pastor lane, and that won't last forever either. The thing is, the lane and the race go together, and as you think about your lane, don't confuse it for your race. And that's what a lot of us do. We think about our roles in life, or our roles here at church, or our roles with our family or in our neighborhood or at our job, and we think that's God's capital P purpose for me. But that's just your lane. God's capital P purpose for you is your race, to win the souls of others, to say thank you and I love you to God, to tend to your soul and give it rest and peace and the Sabbath of knowing Jesus and having a relationship with him. So it's very important. So here's what I wanna lay out for you. Here's what you can fill in. I may choose to be a servant, as Paul did. That's what he says. I, I'm choosing to be a servant, but I do this only after. Will you underline the word after? I am crystal clear about my God-given purposes in life. Are you crystal clear about your race? That you too are here to win the souls of others because you are given the gospel, God wants you to share it with others. Are you crystal clear that your life is a life of thanking God, loving God, bringing glory to God? That's your race as a Christian. Are you crystal clear that God absolutely, positively wants you to pay attention to the health of your soul? If you're a Christian, that's your race. And that's the most important thing for you to think of when you hear purpose. What's my purpose in life? That's it. Now, is it wrong to think about these other purposes like being a pastor or being a volunteer or being a dad or a mom or a grandma or a grandpa? No. God has given you those too. Those are your various callings in life. But remember, those are temporary and they're going to change and they're not nearly as critical and important as understanding the race because you're going to change lanes from time to time. One of the things I think about is being a dad. This is what I've learned about being a dad. As a dad, you get demoted constantly through life. 
So at first, you know, if you've got this little baby and you're holding it and it's awesome, and, and then, you know, the baby starts to grow up and they look at you and that's my dad and that's so awesome. And then what happens is they start to go to school and they hear from other kids and then one day before you know it, they're in high school and they're like, Dad, I don't have time for you right now. I mean, I really don't have time for you right now. And then, they, and then your kid meets someone and they fall in love. And all of a sudden, instead of being like the center and the focus, you're demoted again to, okay, yeah, I, Dad, later because um, I got to go be with the person I love. And then after that, they get married and they have children and now they have all these things drawing on your attention and you have gone from being this much of their life to about that much of their life. Constant demotion. So if you are so focused on your lane, you're gonna focus on something that is gonna shrink and shrink and shrink. But if you focus on your race, and through the gospel, focus on the things that you can do to influence others for Christ and take care of your own soul, you can have an amazing life and you'll know exactly how to set your boundaries like, like Paul does. Now, one of the things we're gonna learn here is Paul has amazing time and energy and flexibility for the capital P purposes of his life. To the Jews, he says, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, although I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. So as to win, do you notice he keeps saying that? So as to win? He's got that on his mind. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I become, became weak. To win the weak, I become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. If you look at this area of Paul's life, it's like he has no boundaries. No rules, complete flexibility, all the time in the world to sit down with someone who's a, a Jewish countryman, a friend, and say, let's talk about Jesus. And then once he leaves him, he goes over here to someone who's a Gentile, a Greek, and he switches it up and comes at it from their angle. And all this energy and all this effort, it's like, yeah, I got no boundaries here. All I want to do is win some people to know Jesus as their Savior and as their Lord. Is he really someone that has no boundaries? Or is he someone that's built boundaries in order to create this sacred space for eternal matters of the soul and other things don't matter as much to him and so those are the things that have been put on the outside of the boundary so that he has all the energy all the time to be as flexible as possible for eternal matters of the soul. That's what he's done. I'll give you a couple examples in just a minute. But there's two things we can learn from this passage. Number one, Paul had few limits in the areas of his life that were most purposeful and important. That's what he's saying in that passage. I, it, if it serves the purpose of me sharing Christ and winning souls for eternity, I got all the time in the world for that. Few limits because this is what's most purposeful and most important to me. What we also learn is how much he stretched. You, you can tell from reading this, can't you, that he's stretching himself to meet people where they're at. To the Jews, I became like a Jew. To those under the law, I became like one under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. To the weak, I became weak become all things to all people. He's making this tremendous effort, but guess what happens? Despite stretching himself and giving his best efforts, Paul still encountered much resistance. Read this book, 1 Corinthians, or read the second letter that he writes, and you'll find that some of the attacks are very personal. The resistance is, is very straight to the heart. Paul, you're not even really an apostle, people said. 
Sometimes the resistance was to his message. Read the book of Galatians and you'll see that people there were attacking his message of salvation by grace alone through Jesus Christ and saying, nope, nope, it's Jesus plus the good, the good things that I do. If, if, if I trust Jesus, but I'm also a good person, Paul says, no, <laughs> you just crossed one of my boundaries. In fact, you just crossed one of God's boundaries. Because the message from God is, it's not God plus you equals salvation, it's God equals salvation, which you receive purely as a gift. So Paul's person was under resistance and under attack, Paul's message, many things came under this resistance, e even sometimes from his friends. He, he had a companion named John Mark, who on his first missionary journey uh, left in the middle of the journey. And this later caused some discussion and debate between him and one of his best friends, Barnabas. But Paul considered that clearly a form of resistance, that he didn't stay the course. So Paul met all kinds of different resistance. But what he did, understanding that this resistance was going to be there, was he, he created space for matters of the soul. Let me, let me give you an example how he did that. So number one, one of the things he said is, I'm not going to spend time on establishing a permanent residence. I'm not getting a mortgage. Not building a home. I, that is effort that I don't need to have, so that goes outside the boundary. And if you read the story of the Apostle Paul, it's the story of a man who's essentially a nomad. And he stays for little short times in various cities and villages sharing the gospel. The longest he ever stays in any place that we're aware of was in Ephesus for about two and a half years. And then he even moves on from there. Despite the fact that he made many beautiful friends, became like family to him, he said, that's outside my boundary because I am creating space for eternal matters of the soul. And while I enjoy these friendships that I have today, while I enjoy this beautiful city, Ephesus, now after two and a half years, it's time to move on. And most places he stayed far less than that. Want to hear one of the crazy ones Paul did? That most people are like, are you kidding me? Read 1 Corinthians 7. Paul says, in order to create more space for eternal matters of the soul and so that, so that I can share the gospel better and serve God better, I will never take a spouse. I'm not getting married. Because I know that if I get married, then... I will have to, because God commands me to, take care of my wife. And likely, because God also says, be fruitful and multiply, we'll have children, and then I'll have children to tend to. Now, understand me clearly here. It's not that Paul's saying that's sinful. He's saying that in my own expression of this race to win souls, to say, God, I love you, to, to honor him, and to also care for my own soul, there are a couple things that, that most normal people do that I just ain't going to do. I'm not going to settle down and build a home or have a mortgage. I'm not going to get married. Now, why am I sharing this with you? Not because the Bible teaches that you should never have a mortgage and settle down. Not because the Bible says, what in the world were you thinking when you got married and had kids? but simply because even today, people will look at some of these boundaries that Paul set and go, that's a crazy man. Guess what's gonna happen to you if you start to set boundaries, even much lighter, lesser ones than this, so that you can serve God better in your life, so that you can create space for eternal matters of the soul. Guess what you're gonna hear? That's nuts. That's crazy. No normal person thinks that way. What, why do you? And the reason I'm sharing this with you is if you want to defeat resistance to boundaries, it, you got to back up and start where Paul started. And that is, here's the race I'm running because of Jesus Christ. And that race involves me winning souls for him because I want others to share what I've received as a gift. 
It, it involves saying thank you to God with my whole life and worshiping, and it involves personal soul care and having space to do that. Isn't that hard? I mean, it's never been harder than in today's world. I grew up with a single mom who worked her backside off to raise me and my little sister Jane, but do you know how she told us to, to play? Go out, I'll see you at supper time. And she didn't even really tell us what time supper time was, which tended to be whenever we got home. Do parents ever do that anymore today? Never. It's, parents today, and, and again, it's, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying this is reality that we are running to and fro, to games, to music practices, to all of this, and, and that's just all been gradually, slowly added into our life, and then you're sitting out there listening to me saying, do you have enough sacred space in your life for God and for eternal matters of the soul? Meanwhile, you're thinking, um, where am I supposed to find that between softball practice for her and baseball practice for him and oboe practice for her? Where am I gonna get that? And here's what I'm saying. What Paul did sometimes was radical things in order to establish boundaries because he believed that eternal matters of the soul were that important. I don't know what those are for you specifically, but what I want you to think is, this is the race that God has laid out for me. And if I have to get radical, I might have to get radical. Flip the page. Paul says, this is how radical I would like to see you get. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. The, the Corinthians would have gotten this because the Corinthians for several hundred years had hosted these games called the Isthmian Games, which, were, which ran opposite to the Olympic Games and actually ran double the amount of the Olympic Games. The Olympics ran once every four years. The Isthmian game ran every other year. And, and so there was a, a deep-seated understanding of sports and competition in the, in the Corinthian culture. And so Paul knew that they knew what it took to be a champion, to win the prize. And, and ironically, do you know what winners of events in the Isthmian Games received to show that they were a winner, I will tell you this, they did not get a gold medal or a silver medal or a bronze medal. They got a little wreath made of dry, wild celery. Pretty cool, huh? Dry, wild celery. Pa Paul says show the kind of dedication that an Olympic athlete would show, even though that prize isn't much. Be that focused. Do you know how focused that is? Olympic athletes, I, I did a little research, typically train six hours a day, six days a week, 12 months a year. That's the typical average for an Olympic athlete. Paul is saying, it takes a lot of focus. Do you know what the diet of an Olympic athlete looks like? 3,500 to 4,000 calories, but don't think of it as 3,500 to 4,000 calories of chips and ice cream, because it ain't that. It's very specific items, nutrients picked out to make up those 3,500 to 4,000 calories, not only specific nutrients, but also specific timing based on when are you gonna train today and when are you gonna rest today. This is how devoted a person needs to be to win an Olympic event. Paul is saying, what if we were as devoted to honoring Christ, loving Christ, and winning the souls of others? Run in such a way as to win the prize. Paul says this, in reality, compared to those big purposes God has given me, I consider everything else as worthy of being jettisoned. It's garbage. 
Philippians 3, 8, and 9, what's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. So here's what I want you to write down. Once I know my race and my lane, we've defined those already, I will stay in it and run to keep the prize. And the, and the prize, you might originally have thought of it as eternal life, but I love the way Paul puts it in Philippians here. He says Jesus Christ is the prize because he is the source of every good blessing in our life. A relationship with him is the prize. Run in such a way that you don't lose this amazing prize of a relationship with Jesus Christ, which brings to you that relationship, brings to you forgiveness, new life, eternal salvation. Number one, he gives me grand eternal purposes, like winning the souls of others, saying thank you with my life, protecting and preserving my own soul. He also gives me smaller temporary purposes like being a grandpa or a husband or a pastor or an entrepreneur. He gives me those lanes. And I will run in those, Paul says. We ought to run in those as if we're trying to win the gold crown, not the parsley crown, the celery crown, but the gold crown, which is the everlasting life. Now, how does that happen? It happens by the grace of God, first of all. Notice what Paul says. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Next to this paragraph, I want you to write in bold letters, grace. Because what Paul says and, and what's true of us is it's God's gift to you. It's by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. If you're listening to this message today, and you're feeling like, oh, I have no earthly clue how I'm gonna set these radical boundaries that that pastor is telling me to set, and, and you just don't know how in the world to even begin, start with grace. It may just be that if you cling to God, he's going to identify one little tiny step that you could take. And then after that, another little tiny step that you could take. You may not be able to adjust and shift your entire life in one day, but you could take one tiny step by the grace of God with his help and with his love. Paul also says, don't expect this to take no effort. He says... Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. We talked about that. They do it to get a crown that will not last, meaning dry, wild celery. And how many of the things in our life that we're striving so hard for right now are nothing more than dry, wild celery? Do you have some dry, wild celery that you're striving for in your life? I'm guessing you do because I do. Paul says... They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. The crown of life. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I run purposefully. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body because I know, Paul says, the major resistance is coming from my own sinful nature. The first blows I have to strike are against myself to make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Here's the bottom line. Defeating resistance to boundaries requires God's grace, but it also requires our focused, diligent, and maybe most of all, persistent effort. What do I want you to do? Notice it says my next step at the very bottom. I'm asking you today to refocus your life on the grand purposes of winning souls, grasping hold of the gospel, 
and keeping Jesus close in your life. That's your race. Run it. Whatever lane you're in, run this race and commit to running this race. And if you want one place to me, for me to suggest to start, it would be create that sacred space in your life to take care of your eternal soul. Here at church, in a growth group, create some space to take care of your soul. Let's pray. Your Father in heaven, you amaze us with your love. And Lord, as, as, as we hear about the devotion and the dedication to run his race, Paul's race, we, we might be struck a little bit with, wow, how are we ever going to make such radical boundaries in our life? Lord, we, we may be struggling with the fact that we're realizing that we, we've run to earn crowns of wild celery and nothing more, temporary, dried up, really good for nothing things. And Lord, we ask you to change our hearts and our minds and help us to run after the eternal matters of the soul and to be, and to be uh, able to retain this amazing gift of salvation and forgiveness that you've given us in your son, Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to please create the boundaries that help us to create that, that space that feeds our soul but also shares the gospel with others. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.